time for our last presentation in this session, last but not least, uh, which is going to be delivered by uh, Nigel Armstrong. Uh, Nigel Armstrong is senior lecturer in French at the University of Leeds, the United Kingdom. His current research, uh, his current teaching and research focus on two related subject areas, that is sociolinguistic variation in contemporary spoken French, and the study uh, of how language is used in popular culture from a translation perspective. So the floor is yours. Thank you. How do I, there's, there's a remote somewhere that you can use. Yeah, it should be the remote somewhere here. Uh oh, maybe it's in my. Oh, it's right there. Yeah, it's here. Yeah. Yeah. Put the arrows and then. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I just thought I'd put up um, a sort of um, piece of Bourdieu uh, for you to ponder on while I'm uh, giving you the sort of introduction to the talk. Um, this is Bourdieu in, in all his uh, sort of, I don't know, sinister splendor. Um, I remember um, talking to Richard Nice uh, once, and he was, he, he was a translator of Bourdieu, and he, he, he was quite frank. He said, I often wonder whether I'm translating this properly. I do frequently uh, you know, feel I, I don't really understand it. Um, Bourdieu is not known for his clarity of expression. Um, I think, to be fair to him, it's a bit of a French convention. You know, there, there seems to be a, um, um, a feeling among French academics that if you're expressing yourself in a, a lucid sort of way, then you, you're, you're just you're a bit simple-minded, perhaps. Um, but certainly Bourdieu is, is a pretty good, um, pretty good example of this tendency. Um, I, um, w w when I was thinking about presenting this stuff from a Bourdieuian point of view, I, I, I felt a little bit uneasy. Um, I, I think I, um, I mentioned to one of the postcards yesterday. I was. I was Talking to some other academic, and and, and then say, and I said, I, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, you know trying to do an update on um, Bourdieu's distinction for uh, uh, for um, um, I think it's probably 40 years on, and she said something like, oh yeah, I think I, Bourdieu, that's a that's a phase we all go through, I think, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, I don't want to spend this half hour, uh, you know, kicking Bourdieu. It, 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 it'd be, you know, it's a shame to take the money, as we say in England. Um, it'd be too easy. It, it's not difficult to criticise him. But at the same time, his, his, um, he, he's one of those people, it seems to me, who sort of, um, um, obviously, he was a public intellectual, and he, he, he was one of those people who was responsible, for, in a way, for sort of creating the intellectual weather. And... Um, he, he was a Marxist, of course, or a Mar Mar Marxian, or Marxoid, or whatever, whatever suffix you want to put on the end of it. Um, um, and he um, <coughs> clearly, he, he, he uh, you know, he, he looked at. He seems to have looked at pretty much everything from from that point of view. Marx is no longer taken seriously as, a, as an economist, is he? And um, I think it's fair to say that his his ideas have been falsified empirically, to put it mildly. Nevertheless, the, 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 the Marxist uh, way of looking at things is, is, continues to sort of pervade uh, the intellectual atmosphere, as I say, especially in the academy, I think, but also outside. Um, <clears throat> the idea of capital, the idea of cultural capital is, is, is now, a, or social capital, has is, is become a commonplace, hasn't it? I, I believe Bourdieu didn't invent the term social capital, but he is I suppose he must have helped to popularise it and brought you and his, his adherents. Um, I'll, I'll talk about social capital in a, in a little while, but the, the, other, the other thing that, the other sort of essential idea of Marxism um, has, it seems to me, really taken on. Um, 
um, taken, has been taken on board and it's become, as I say, part of the, one of the basic assumptions that, that lots of people seem to have. The idea of life as, as a, you know, um, a zero-sum game, if you like. There's got to be a winner, there's got to be a loser. And I was very happy to, uh, you know, when I was looking through that, the abstract to this conference to see that quite a few of you just don't, you know, you don't these things, see things in those terms. It's not necessary always, it seems to me, to, uh, you know, see things as a competition. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an idea which is really, you know, s soaked in. Um, it was mentioned yesterday, wasn't it, that um, Bourdieu was a great advocate of, um, of um, uh, interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity, yes. Um, and um, I, I'm sure you've all... Um, he, he wrote a great deal, didn't he? He, he wrote, uh, you know, 30 books, I seem to remember, and 300 papers. That's pretty, that's pretty good going. Um, he wrote on all sorts of topics. I'm sure everyone in this room has been... Um, aware of um, non-specialists um, uh, sort of, I don't want to express it ne negatively, but let's say encro encroaching on your, um, on, on, on one's uh, specialism. In a discipline, isn't into being, uh, building bridges between <laughs> disciplines can be great, but I'm sure you've all had the experience of some non-specialist um, uh, talking about, well, linguistics in my case, and um, yeah, you have this. You get this feeling of irritation, don't you, when you realise they don't really, they don't quite know what they are, what they're talking about. And I often get that. Uh, I often get that feeling of yeah. Uh, especially when he talks about language. Um, we'll look at that again in, in, in a um, little while. If we if we look at this um, uh, quotation, I, I, I genuinely um, sort of um, appreciate your help with this, actually. I must have read it <coughs> several dozen times and I, I still can't quite decide whether he's just saying the same thing twice or whether he's um, sort of um, um, looking at the same thing from two different points of view. Um, one of the helpful things that um, Bourdieu has done actually in, in linguistics, <coughs> linguistics is to to, um, to bring in the idea of the legitimate language, la langue légitime, you know, or the légitimé, uh, which is a better term than standard, actually, I think, because what, one of the properties of the standard language is its ability to uh, legitimise forms which hitherto have been non-standard. And it's, it's, you know, the, 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 if, you, if you talk about the, uh, the standard language, that gives an idea of immobility, doesn't it? Monol uh, a sort of monolithic quality, which is quite wrong, because the standard language is not on changing. Um, the paradox, as I say, is that it is capable of absorbing what was non-standard into itself and transforming it into standard. Um, so from that point of view, I think if we, if we talk about the leg legitimate language, it's, 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 a, it's a more helpful term. And it seems to be due to uh, Bourdieu, that actually. Um, the paradox of the in imposition of le legitimacy, it's um, it's hard to know whether the dominant feature appears as distinguished or noble because it is dominant or uh, because it has the privilege of defining blah, 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 um, a privilege which is expressed precisely in, in its self-assurance. And, you know, this is the, all the Bourdieu stuff about uh, how, um, you know, the, the middle classes or the upper classes are in a position of defining what is, what is um, well, noble, if you like, distinguished. Or whether it's only because it's dominant that it appears as endowed with these qualities and uniquely qualified. Is that saying the same thing twice or or, or is it? Is, is it not? I'm, I'm not sure. But um, it's um, it's a uh, um, well it's a commonplace of sociolinguistics that there is no essential quality in any stretch of language um, which is which is which is, is possible to look at from a if you like from an aesthetic point of view. Um, it just happens that the standard language has its prestige because of it's borrowed that prestige from the from the, um, the speakers who control it. Um, and the classic test, you know, is you know, ask a foreigner to um, listen to um, you know a stretch of standard language, standard English, shall we say, or uh, um, as opposed to uh, a stretch of Yorkshire dialect, and ask them which they think is nicer. 
they won't have any clue because they they uh, you know they don't they they haven't got um, you know they haven't got the um, the um, ability to um, understand the standard non-standard system in England. Um, so uh, if that question is you know uh, already answered if you like. Um, even though this sort of um, nonsense about the essential nobility of um, you know sort of prestigious things is still very much present in the in the, um, in the popular Im imagination, if you like. Um, excuse me, I, I must just have a, a quick thing. The next bit uh, illustrates my point about the this interdisciplinary uh, business. <coughs> it's no accident that this, uh, <coughs> to designate the uh, legit, legitimate manners or tastes, only languages can tend to say manners or taste in the absolute sense, as grammarians say. Um, <coughs> uh, well, no, of course, it's not an accident. Or if it is an accident, it's a sort of accident of human psychology, if you like. But it's quite true, you know. You, you're in English, and I'm, sh I'm sure in other languages as well. You, you, you'll say um, he has um, he has manners, or um, he knows how to behave, or you, or you say to a <coughs> child, um, behave, behave yourself. Um, obviously, as soon as you start to think about that, it's nonsense, isn't it? Behavior is just something that we do. Um, underlying that is the idea of um, okay, behave. He knows how to behave. In other words, he um, his his behaviour is um, uh, well. What would Bourdieu say? His, his behaviour is um, in line with our popular I don't know conception of a Christian gentleman or something like that for an upper class uh, you know an upper class person. Um, is that true? Well, uh, you don't know. You don't need to be tremendously versed in linguistics to um, uh, be aware that you know that there are other ways of exper <coughs> explaining this sort of thing. Where the you know the um, the superordinate uh, or, or the apparently neutral term um, comes on to, comes to take on a, a positive acceptation, and in fact there there is a, um, a theory in psychology which is called the the uh, the Pollyanna hypothesis, which basically just says well we there's a strong psychosocial tendency to um, uh, look on the bright side of life you know like I don't know if you know Pollyanna but. To, uh, there's a, uh, a novel called Poly Poly Pollyanna, and the heroine was a notoriously um, um, cheerful sort of person. Um, we, um, we therefore, in, in English, for example, we say when we say um, I was impressed, uh, the default interpretation there is I was I was favourably impressed, but that, you know that's not necessarily so, is it? We can say I was uh, yes, I was I was. I was greatly impressed in an ironical sort of way to uh, to, to express the op opposite, and you know there are double uh, other double-edged adjectives in English like that, or uh, you know, very interesting or mm, extraordinary, where um, you're if you use it ironically, you're in fact um, you know exploiting the fact that adjectives like that are in fact normally uh, construed in a positive way, and that is due, according to the. Um, Psychologists who formulate Pollyanna, you know, there's a there's a sort of it's either a basic psychological tendency, or there's sort of social pressure to um, look at things in a in a <coughs> in a cheerful sort of way, which I deplore personally. But there you go. So um, I guess what I'm talking about in this paper is a language, culture, wor world view, but it. In a way, a sort of um, language turned back on itself and um, tried to consider language attitudes, I suppose, as a sort of as a sort of world world view. Uh, the way that people ha have attitudes towards language that are, um, um, I, I, I suppose, just they just betray the attitudes, their attitudes towards the other speakers. Which um, clearly, um, you know, is an ideology, isn't it, or, or a world, a world view. Um, <coughs> if we just look at uh, another quotation here, <coughs> so uh, Bourdieu asks, um, 
what is it about um, what is it about um, the standard language? Is it noble because um, um, because of some essential quality in the language, or is it um, does it enjoy prestige because the prestige of its users uh, just um, uh, reflect onto it? Um, the, the, the sensible answer is, is is the second one. You know, we we um, we 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 sort of um, respect prestige because it's um, because it's powerful, and the behaviour of prestigious people, um, you know, becomes prestigious, including the language. Um, look at this though. This was um, uh, fr from uh, Wilde, who was Merton Professor of English Language. In um, uh, I think he was the predecessor of Tolkien, in fact, at, um, at Ox Oxford. And uh, what, what he says is that um, if, it, if it were possible to compare systematically, I wish I could do this in an RP, you know, so if it were possible to compare systematically every vowel, sound, and receive stem words, <laughs> which is the, uh, you know, uh, RP, receive pronunciation, it's, you know, the, the way the Queen speaks. Uh, with corresponding sound in a, in a number of pr provincial and other dialects. Here we've got the... He's, he's almost French here, isn't he, in his, just, um, in his contempt for the provinces. Um, I believe no unbiased listener, uh, unbiased is good, isn't it, would, would hesitate in preferring it to... Uh, as the most pleasing and sonorous form and the best suited to, to the medium of poetry and or oratory, this is the uh, this is the, the the standard attitude towards the um, to legitimate language. It's 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 you know it's one of the characteristics, isn't it, of the standard language? It's best suited for li literature. Literature, non-standard literature, is pretty much by definition a contradiction. Um, um, uh, what can we say about something like this? It, it's um, it, it, it was written, admittedly, it was written 70 years ago. Uh, we can, I suppose we can say that um, you know, things have moved on since then. Um, uh, it's still pretty astonishing, though, isn't it? it, it, it here, is, here is a man who's a lexicographer, who, who did linguistics. You know, he, he, he was productive. He, um, he, he was a sort of, I guess, well, he, probably, he himself would probably describe himself as a ph philologist, I think. But the, the lack of insight is astonishing. Um, but I think this is only a, one of the more extreme examples of, 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 of the language attitudes that you still have now, I think. I, I live in Leeds, which is in Yorkshire, in the north of England, and um, I, I was amazing. I was, I was amazed. I was watching the TV not so long ago. There were um, there's some little feature about how um, uh, translating opera into um, into the local dialect, you know, into into Yorkshire English, you know, and uh, it's it's quite funny actually. It was someone singing, uh, you know, that famous aria from Rigoletto, you know, La Donna Immobile, in uh, Yorkshire Yorkshire English. But <laughs> what was amazing was um, the, the translator was constantly talking about the um, <coughs> the flat vowels of Yorkshire. Now, anyone who knows phonetics uh, is, is aware that flat, you know, there is no such thing as a flat vowel. It just has no phonetic reference at all. But um, it's what people always say, you know, when they talk about uh, Yorkshire. Oh, I hate the Yorkshire dialect. It's all oh, oh, this flat vowel. What you really say, of course, is that you don't, you know, you don't like Yorkshire very much, I suppose. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't um, and it, in a way, it's, it's sort of understandable, I think. These are really social judgments. Um, <laughs> I, in, a, in, a, in a country like the UK, where you know, regional dialects are very important, it, um, uh, you know, numerous studies have shown a, a ranking of the various, of the various dialects. And you know, for some reason, Birmingham always comes out at the bottom. I don't know why. It's always the least, uh, the least uh, you know, favoured. Um, but it's, uh, it's perfectly understandable, as I say. You know, I come from Newcastle in the northeast of England. I'm still fond of the dialect, but I think there's nothing, you know, there's, there's nothing rocket, rocket, rocket scientific about this. You know, you, 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 you grow up in a certain place and you, the associations that you have for that place are, very, are usually very pleasant, aren't they? Let's face it, most people have a pleasant childhood. You know, you're up to the age of seven or something, you're completely carefree and it's, it's lovely. Um, and you associate everything with that place. I, I grew up in a place called North Shields, you know, which is um, by any 
objective standards are a whole. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a very pleasant place. But I'm still fond of it. <laughs> then you move to Yorkshire, which is, you know, another uh, Leeds, another post-industrial, uh, you know, um, grimy uh, town. And you, well, you know, objectively, you've got no reason to like it, have you? So, uh, and that includes that includes the dialect. I, I you know, I, I, when you move somewhere else, you, you pick up some of the um, local words, perhaps. But you wouldn't dream of trying to imitate the accent. Um, uh, there's just no motiva- mo- motivation. Um, similarly, with um, apart from the fact it's it's difficult, uh, you know, unless you're a really good mimic. Um, so yes, flat vowels, um, and uh, you know, uh, we had a little glimpse of that yesterday, didn't we? When people were talking about one of the Slavic languages, I think, and um, you're basically saying, well, because because. Um, because uh, was it Polish or Czech people talk about the dear, the dear little son? Then that well, that's a sort of what's that in the jargon? I think it's a hypercharistic term, isn't it? You know, sort of childish language. Therefore, what, therefore there must be a bunch of children. You know, or uh, I, I think vodka is similar, isn't it? Doesn't, doesn't vodka mean dear little water or something like that? Water. Little water. Water. Little water. Little or water. Or, or, or water king, perhaps you might say. <laughs> um, it's again, it's a term of endearment, endearment, I suppose, isn't it? Um, I've, I've heard it said about Russian, you know, because they, uh, because they have no definite articles and they, uh, I believe they don't use copulative verbs, is, is that right? So, so the, book on the, ta- the book is on the table would be something like uh, uh, the book on table, yeah. you know. So uh, uh, that, that is put forward as, a, as, a, as an argument to, uh, that Russian people must in some sense be rather, rather primitive, you know. So it's exactly the same mindset, isn't it? You know, you're, you're, uh, you're sort of um, operating in two directions, I suppose. You don't like the language. What you're really saying is you don't like the people. Or if you, if you uh, focus on some arbitrary aspect of the language, then you use that to, um, to um, give the people a good, a good kicking. So e- even though this is very, you know, this is a, an extreme example of... Um, of, of you know the, the, the myth that um, upper class, upper class what upper class sort of social practices are in some way superior. It's still um, you know it's still pervasive. It's still it's still a very commonplace. I think. Um, just moving on to an example of language change. I I'd, um, really just want to il- illustrate how. Um, I suppose just how the, how the fact that um, a, w- a, w- a word in favour of Bourdieu is w- once again, you know, the idea that the, 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 the um, it's, it's best to talk about the leg- legitimate language rather than the standard language. This is um, there's that, and then there's, there's also the, the different ling- linguistic levels that it's possible to, to to think about. This is from a novel called uh, When the Wind Blows by Cyril Hare. Uh, uh, and it's um, of interest, I think, because um, I, I think it's always interesting to see how li- linguistic change is um, is exploited in, in in literature. Cyril Hare was a was a barrister and a high court judge, highly placed socially. Um, here we've got um, here we've got a bit of uh, um, anti anti women uh, discourse, if you like. There's someone called um, uh, Violet talking about the phone and, and she's being described in the um, in the narrative um, on either side as being as being kittenish and she's talking to her lover over the phone and she's trying to uh, you know trying to uh, win him round to her point of view um, it's nice the way the author is using non-standard language to uh, subtly well not all that subtly actually quite grossly denigrate what the, what the woman is saying um, can't just nothing be done about it just appear Please, poor little Violet. Notice the spelling of poor. Um, this is 49, about, what, 60 years ago? 65 years. Uh, l- longer than that. Um, when I want to talk about linguistic change with, with students in the UK, the first thing I always do is I write a poor on the board. P-O-O-R. And then I point to the nearest student and say, how do you pronounce that? And it, always, it's poor. Okay? Poor. Now, this is, a, this is just a linguistic change that is going on in English. It's pretty much complete now. I say poor. That is because I, um, it's, uh, you know, 
dialectologist in the room will 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 know that it's a, a sort of um, I don't know. It must be a change that's been re radiating out from the south of east of England, I think. And like all of these things, you know, they they radiate out and basically push the older forms um, into the sea. But um, it's still um, it's still current where where I come from, and it's also a generational thing. You know, I, I say poor and not poor. Uh, Almost all young people in England will now say poor, I think. Um, my, my wife, who comes from the northwest, actually, she says poor, so that it's slightly, um, it's like a lot of these dialectological things, you know, it's, it's quite complicated. Um, it's obvious from the text here, though, that, that Hare himself would have, said, would have said poor, I think. And in fact, if you, if you look at um, Daniel Jones's classic book, you know, the, pronunciation of English, he, he indicates, I think it was just at the time when the, tip, the change was starting to tip over and people, more and more people were starting to say poor, he was saying that the older pronunciation in, in RP is poor, but it's, um, it's, it was just at that time when it was starting to be noticed and disapproved of that Hare was able to exploit this uh, in, in a, you know, in a very if you like, in a very powerful way. He's, he's attributing this pronunciation to, to poor little Violet in order to denigrate her, you know. This woman is um, being childish um, and this is one of the ways that it's, uh, it's being um, demonstrated. There's also the double negative as well. You, you, you know, say, can't just nothing be done? I don't, I don't think that's, that's not really right. Is it? Can't, can't anything be done? So, uh, there's a two-pronged attack there, grammar and, grammar and pronunciation. Um, as I said before, she's, dis she's described as being kittenish. And, th and th I think that's a, f that's a, the, that's a if you like, a misogynistic term, isn't it? I think, I think it's a term that's only ever applied to women, women uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, being playful in an irritating sort of way, I think, is, is, is my understanding of kittenishness. Um, but there's, there's, the, there's the further sort of connection, I think, between non-standard and, um, and the childish, I think. You know, that, that, that's a further association which is often comes along with, uh, you know, this stuff is working class, therefore it's got to be awful. Um, and there's also a, quite often a sort of childish correlate as well, you know, which is, um, you know, Present in many many people's minds, I think. Um, Nigel, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, wh wh so when we um, when we look at um, uh, non-standard pronunciation like this, we, we um, it seems to me that we quite often judge it in sort of aesthetic terms, and uh, as, I, as I said before, you know, I hate Yorkshire dialect. It's so it's so ugly, it's so sloppy. You know, these terms for a linguist are meaningless. But um, what what is of interest, quite a, um, of some interest in um, English, is the difference between grammar and um, um, uh, and um, um, pronunciation. It seems to me that quite often pronunciation, as I say, is, is judged in sort of aesthetic terms, whereas um, grammar is more of, more of a co cognitive thing. The, sort of, uh, the popular argument would be, well, you know, if you look at this, the dog's is bark barking. It's perfectly co comprehensible, but as someone, uh, you know, from the standard point of view, there's, there's a problem there that needs to be fixed. And you think, sort of, well, if you, could, if you can't get the verbs in English right, what, you know, what, what can you get right? Because they're, so e they're so easy, you know? So you, you, if, if you come up with this sort of stuff, you, you, you must be cognitively impaired in some way. Even though there are plenty of people in, um, in um, you know, the UK and, and the, in the US who have this, uh, what would you call it, non-standard subject verb, concord, I suppose, something like that. Um, and it's um, also from a linguistic point of view, you know, it's, um, there's, a, uh, there's a sort of di dissonance, you know, Ch Chomsky would probably say, well, you know, this is okay actually because uh, here you've got the semantic information, dogs, and, and all, you, all, you be, all that's being conveyed in the is it's, it's just grammatical information, which you know, from a from a communicative point of view, is not not all that necessary. Um, do, do do ordinary people have that perception? 
it's, it's hard to know, you know, because that's a sort of technical linguistic point. But what, what is certain is, you know, lots of people will look on that very, very unfavourably and judge it worse than pronunciation, I would have thought. And um, this sort of stuff can only be um, used in a, a sort of jocular way, I think. Um, the informant who used to say this was born in 1960, 1916, and he, 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 he was in fact my father. And he would used to say, God, my dogs is barking. By which he meant his, his, his feet were aching. I, 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 is, that, is anyone aware of that? Yeah. Well, really? Answers. Wow. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was a... I was starting to think it was sort of private family language or something. No, but, 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 but to go to market. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, I mean, again, I, I tend to, I sometimes ask uh, students, you know, what, what, uh, what, here's a sentence that is perfectly possible for, you know, to say in English. Uh, what, what would you say bothers you the most about this sentence? Uh, I would have thought that, you know, because it's grammar. Mm. But, uh, you yeah, know, credit. Plenty of people focus on this, me dogs, me dogs, even though, you know, the, it, it was very, um, it's perfectly possible about a hundred years ago to say me, me dogs. And it, in fact, this is one of the things that standardization has squeezed out of the language. This, of course, is very, very, very common. Um, I'm running out of time, so I, I, I just wanted very quickly to look at things from a um, compar comparative linguistic point of view. These are just a few figures which illustrate the, the very um, sharp disjunction between in precisely this, uh, this area of variation. And um, wherever English is spoken, it seems that, uh, you know, uh, not, um, not using the, the correct, not using the standard um, verb inflection is something that distinguishes, how can you say, parts educated people from on it. Educated people who are uh, people have been uh, you know people who have been um, influenced by the standard language. Uh, th this is huge, you know, lower middle class, upper working class, to seventy and almost. Um, Norwich in the UK and Detroit, uh, even in, even in even in America, where you know things are more I don't know arguably more uh, loose and democratic. There's still a bit there's still a big big difference there. Grammar is one of those things that uh, really um, uh, spooks English people, uh, English speaking people. And um, this is what really does my head in. Uh, if you look at variable syntax in French, how can it be that one language tolerates variable syntax and another one doesn't? Anyone who knows French that, uh, um, knows that it's um, formulating questions in French can, can, is a bit of a headache sometimes. And one of the reasons is that there's so many ways of doing it. Uh, the, these are, quand uh, voulez vous when, when are you coming? Um, these are, well, perhaps the, I don't know, the, the first four are probably the, the four most common ways of doing it. Uh, this one is formal, this one is sort of uh, neutral, I'd say, in, certainly in speech. Vous venez quand? That's more of a sort of echo question, isn't it? Je viens quatre heures. Vous venez quand? That sort of thing. But it's still possible as an ordinary question, I think. And then, quand vous venez, that, that, that would, that's a sort of form that tends to raise eyebrows. It's a bit, um, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit non-standard, that one. Um, and finally, just um, from a translation perspective, if we look at um, problems of equivalence, um, I don't know if you've ever come across Zazie dans le métro, it's by uh, a French writer called Raymond Queneau. Uh, D'où qui plus dans le temps? Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those famous first lines, you know, it's a bit like the first line of Moby Dick or Swan's Way or something. D'où qui plus dans le temps? And uh, the, the context is that uh, the, the, there's a fellow who's standing on the uh, plat platform of the Gare Saint-Lazare, I think, or somewhere like that. And um, he's, he's standing in a rather unwashed crowd. And he's saying to himself, Do keep you don't know, sort of, uh, 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 those of you who know French, what, what do you think that means? How come? How come they stink so much, do you think? Do uh, uh, Sort of, it's certainly, the, the point is, it, it's very non standard to say do que. Do que, I don't know, do que tu viens, something like that. Um, 
the standard English translation of this uh, can't do anything with that. It can't do anything with du que, for the very simple and obvious reason is that we just don't have much variation in uh, the formulation of questions in English. Not much, not nearly as much as in English, uh, in French anyway. How can they do it? It's quite, it's quite, it's quite sort of in, ingenious actually, isn't it? Uh, how can they think so though? Miss out the third. That's that's a that's a nifty idea actually. So you, but but what you're um, what you what you're doing there is you're substituting uh, variation in phonology for variation in grammar. This I always think is a very a very um, that's a very clever idea. Uh, even though it's though, even though pr the pronunciation is the same, they're, they're using a sort of informal um, uh, bit of spelling to add informality to the text. Um, so there, here you've got variation in grammar, which uh, the, the translator is pow powerless to do anything about that. It's got to be substituted by translation in um, pronunciation. Um, as I said, uh, what is what is really puzzling is, um, uh, what, what always puzzles me is what, what it must like, be like to be a French speaker um, who is comfortable with, with variable syntax. And it really is variable syntax, and it really is syntax as well, isn't it? In the sense of word order, as opposed to being an English speaker way, uh, that, that sort of thing is, is pretty much ruled out. Um, what is it going to show? I, I, well, I don't know. From a standardising point of view, I suppose it it sort of demonstrates that the standardising process sort of latches onto things in a fairly arbitrary way and, and it, it will exclude some things but, but leave, leave others intact. Um, and um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Is I, I realise I'm starting to get a bit, bit incoherent towards the end there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to